Our guest today is Professor Sam Kirstein of the University of Maryland. Uh, Sam is a specialist in medical ethics, and we're going to be talking to him today about the ethics of human, human genome editing. Uh, welcome to Manifold, Sam. Thank you very much. Good to be here. So in the interest of full disclosure, I can say that Sam is an old friend of mine. Maryland was the second place that I taught in my philosophy career and the last place that I uh, worked in philosophy. But uh, Sam and I got very close there. We had many, many long conversations in Adams Morgan over drinks and in the philosophy office. And I invite Sam because he's uh, incredibly knowledgeable, extremely thoughtful, and uh, always gives me very nuanced views on ethics. I see myself as kind of an ethical primitivist. And every time I talk to Sam, I realize that my views are a little bit um, crude, shall we say. But uh, this is our second episode on human genome editing. And we're going to be discussing the ethics of changing the genome of humans. And we'd like to look at it from different perspectives, because I think, I sincerely believe that this is something that's going to be coming uh, sooner. It's already happened, and it's going to be come increasingly common, whether we like it or not. I think a number of countries have passed moratoria on the issue. But like a lot of technology, I don't know who said it first, but something's technologically possible, it's going to happen. It's very hard to keep these things, you know, uh, in the bag. So we'd like to talk about uh, the issues that they raise. And it's especially important now because last year, Chinese researcher uh, He Jiankou claimed to have created the first two genetically engineered embryos, and they were born. I think it's now been confirmed, Steve, is that right? That uh, The second... Uh, so, so there were a pair of girls produced, and then it's been confirmed that there's at least one other pregnancy, I believe. But I think it's been confirmed that they were born, I thought. So I, I haven't seen that, but it very well might have. I just didn't know. Anyway, the news caused a firestorm around the world. Uh, many scientists denounced what Hu had done. Uh, the Chinese government arrested him, uh, branded him a renegade. He was fired by his university, and nearly everyone expressed horror about it. So I'd, I'd like to begin with Sam uh, just talking about in general terms, what who did and kind of related procedures that may be more acceptable, Sam. So people distinguish between editing for enhancement and editing for therapeutic purposes. How would you distinguish those two? Corey, that is not an easy distinction to make. Um, here's one reason why. Suppose you edit an embryo so that the resulting person doesn't have a certain disorder. The same changes that you make to ensure that she doesn't have that might enhance other capacities she has. So it might make her have a better memory than she otherwise would have. It, in the case of the, the twins and uh, Dr. He, it may well be that those girls uh, have better memory capacity than they otherwise would have had they not been edited, had their embryos not been edited to make sure they didn't get infected with HIV. So this is kind of a common distinction to make because I think people often want to say that possibly editing for therapeutics is okay, but enhancement's not. And what you're suggesting is that that line's not very easy to draw. It's not. I mean... Think about this. Um, suppose that we could increase the human lifespan through gene editing. One way to look at that is that it's not really enhancement, it's some kind of treatment. We're letting nature's gifts shine forth for a longer period than they otherwise would have. Would have. On the other hand, some people would say, no, that's clearly uh, enhancement. Um, let me give you some, uh, at least one other example. Some vaccines that are given to people are, are pretty fancy. Now, um, one way to look at them is that they are, are enhancing the human immune system. Another way to look at them is to say, well, no, they're, they're just um, preventing certain harms that might come about, and so are a kind of treatment. But I hope you can see that where you draw that line isn't absolutely clear. So I guess I can ask you the kind of blunt question, right? If this line 
can't be drawn clearly. And so the line that people usually draw in trying to assess the ethics of what he did. Steve, how do you pronounce the name? Huh. Huh. How Huh did. It's like a grunt. Huh. Uh, Huh. What Hood did, what's your view, Sam, on what he's accomplished? Well, I think that he acted wrongly. He did something that was morally impermissible. Why? Not because uh, gene editing is inherently impermissible, always impermissible, but because he didn't have sufficient evidence that what he was doing would be safe or effective. You can't just go around making changes like this unless you have a lot more evidence under your belt. That's, by my reading, the scientific consensus, and it's what I believe. So I, I want to push back a little bit. Um, I think there's a, a variety of ways in which you could defend what Hood did. So let me, let me give you this argument see what you think. Let's look at it not from the perspective of her, but from the perspective of the parents. And we also don't know what kind of deliberations went on between her and the parents, but um, why isn't this simply a matter of reproductive freedom? Uh, people have a choice about how they want to bring offspring in, into this world, and people do lots of things when they bring offspring into the world. They choose their partners. You know, there's a very thriving, uh, normal social and sexual market of people deciding that they want a certain kind of partner who's got who's got certain characteristics. Maybe they're tall, maybe they're smart, maybe they're athletic, maybe they're a certain racial group. There's also a very thriving market in uh, eggs. And so people have a lot of freedom there. And people are also free to reproduce the people who are unhealthy, who in some sense they know may pass on undesirable characteristics to their offspring. And we th- I think we have a sense of all that's okay. There's no requirement that people reproduce with the genetically best person they can find. So why is what Hood did in that sense any different than just allowing these people to freely reproduce? Well, let me ask you a question. Do you think it's morally permissible to, for a doctor to engage in an enhancement on a living child when what she proposes to do has been proven neither safe nor effective? Is that okay? I mean, is it within the parent's purview to say, um, oh, I want you to try this thing that's never been tried on a child to maybe make her more resistant to something she might get? I think the answer is probably no. Um, Yeah, the uh, parents do have, we think, some kind of protected space of procreative autonomy. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they can choose for their offspring that um, they undergo dangerous, potentially very damaging procedures when those procedures are not necessary for the offspring to have a thriving life. There There are other things that can be done to prevent these girls from having uh, HIV or reducing the likelihood that they'll get HIV. All right, let me try another perspective, okay? Here's my, uh, another one. I, I, think, I think you're making a fair point, but here's something else that has occurred to me. This is why I'm a little bit cynical about scientists who oppose gene editing. You describe the basic scientific consensus as that you should be allowed to edit the embryo but that implanting it is impermissible. And this sounds to me dangerously like a kind of obligatory abortion rule. That you're saying you can actually have your scientific fun with this embryo, but then you have to throw it away. It's impermissible actually to allow this embryo to develop into a child. And I'm, if, you know, if someone's pro-life, I think they're gonna be very resistant to this idea that a particular embryo is somehow uh, obligatorily to be destroyed. And since we're not talking about a child that already exists that you're gonna be providing a medical procedure on, if you don't implant, this offspring won't exist. And so, right. that's my, but that's my reaction. Once you've edited the embryo, uh, isn't it permissible 
which scientists think is okay. Isn't it permissible, actually, to uh, implant? Well, so suppose, uh, you, I, I don't think you believe the following, Corey. I don't think you believe that just because scientists do something to an embryo, that entails that it's okay for them to implant the embryo in a uterus. Suppose they really screw it up. And what would be produced is a being who would suffer for a couple of years, then die. I mean, it's not just the manipulations that would um, make it uh, a right of theirs to implant the embryo and produce a person, right? So you're, you're not saying that. No, I'm not saying that. If you know that the life the embryo is going to lead is going to be a life not worth living, then you probably have reason not to implant. But that wasn't the case here. Right, you you weren't exactly sure what the outcome would be, but you had no reason to believe this embryo would develop into a child that had a horrific disease that would not be worth living. The, the balance of evidence did not suggest that. So, I don't right. think that. So, in that okay. case, it seems like it seems completely fine to actually uh, implant. Well, um, first of all, what one might say is not completely fine to implant an embryo where you know gene editing experiments have been done. Uh, if there is serious doubt as to whether that embryo was harmed and so might come out uh, with really, really serious health problems. But look, at the background, in the background, and you, and you recognize this, in the background is a big debate about the moral status of embryos. There are certain thinkers, uh, some Catholic thinkers, for example, who think of embryos as having the moral status of you or I. Embryos are persons. So if you have that view, then you know doing these experiments on embryos is itself wrong. So you've already taken a, a, a big ethical misstep from that perspective. But once you take that misstep, right, which most scientists think is okay, once you take that misstep, it seems like from the Catholic point of view, you, you have perfect right, you may in fact be obligated to implant the embryo and allow it to become a person. So if you, if you do what scientists today think is totally acceptable, you're then almost morally obligated to allow, unless you think the embryo is going to become, have horrific damage to it. Right. But, but, in, the, but in the case you're talking about, I believe that the editing of the embryo is irrelevant. There are some Catholic thinkers who would say, look, you produced an embryo, you produced a person in not implanting it, you are in effect condemning it either to death by being thrown away or what might be worse, a, a destiny of being frozen for decades and then being thrown away. So the, the fact that there's been some editing of the embryo seems to me not to make a, a, a moral difference in, in from that perspective in this case. So Corey, I, I don't want to derail because I think you you have a series of uh, a line of uh, investigation that you want to go through with Sam. But I, I do want to say that if in fact Ha was acting recklessly, so taking risks with the health, future health of these uh, young girls because the uh, intrinsic procedure was unsafe or no one could predict how it would turn out, I think uh, everybody would condemn that. So sort of doctor practicing medicine recklessly is a bad thing, and uh, nobody disagrees with that. I think the harder case, which is the case that's really going to haunt us in the future, is technology works well. Everybody agrees that it's likely to work well. Parents or physician or IVF scientists decide they want to do something, which gives some benefit to the uh, girls in this case, under what circumstances is that okay through a germline edit? And I think that's that's the that's the one that's the specific scenario that uh, we're going to face in the near future, um, and that I think most of the attention should be focused on. I think you're right, long term. But but remember, Steve, to get there, you've got to go through people carrying out cases like this, where you actually don't know the outcomes, and waiting to see what the outcomes are going to be positive or not. Right. So so it. Under the question of what kinds of risks with people's well-being uh, one should be allowed to take in the service of medical research, that's also an interesting question, but I think that's not the one that society's going to fight over for the next few decades, because imagine we get past that somehow, and we, we agree this stuff really works, 
uh, I can make a Superman or I can make a person whose life expectancy is 200 years. Um, should I do that? And who gets to decide whether I should do that? Do you have thoughts, Sam? Yeah, the, those are very difficult questions. And w- one thing that people are very concerned about is um, those with money, with resources, enhancing their children and those children passing on those benefits to their children and thus creating some kind of super class of human beings and by implication some further underclass of human beings. I mean, we might conceivably get to a a point where um, some human beings largely because they've been from privileged stock are smarter significantly on average than human beings ever have been. And in terms of how we live with one another, how we live together, that that presents some real difficulties. For example, would these um, far more intelligent human beings have rights that, that I don't have? by virtue of their greater intelligence? Would they have to be careful with me, be paternalistic with me, take care of me uh, from a perspective of greater wisdom as we take care of our kids? So there, there are a bunch of issues that come up. Yeah, I think those are real issues, and I think those are not science fiction issues. Those are issues that we'll face possibly by the end of our lifetimes. So. You know, one, I think this has raised a bunch of questions. And look, I have no doubt, at least personally, that these things are going to come to fruition. So I think it's best that we begin to think about them now. And, you know, it seems quite likely that what's going to be edited in the short term may be genes like this, where we know there's a, there's a cognitive effect, but also there may be genes that aren't, they're going after characteristics that aren't quite as complicated as intelligence that are, say, you know, single gene uh, or you know, small numbers of genes involved. Uh, you know, someone wants a child with uh, different color eyes. I want, maybe I want a child with green eyes. And in that case, it seems that you have to balance essentially the desire, the value of the characteristic over the risk that it will pose. So my assumption is early on, you're going to have some discussions about whether a characteristic is really, really needed for the child or not. And this is going to come back to the distinction between therapeutic and uh, enhancing. So if you were to think about characteristics that are probably likely to happen in the near term, I expect to be probably things like immunity to disease. Those I expect to be the ones we'll be confronted with. And I think they'll probably be the easiest for us to handle. And there it seems like, just like Hugh, I think people think of Hu as being acting rather recklessly, but in that sense, I think he targeted one that will probably get through fairly early just because it is against a very dangerous disease. So do, does that change? I mean, given we, the fact we have to get through this period of kind of unclarity, right? It's not clear how you're going to get clear about the outcomes except by running this experiment. Does that change your view of the current state of gene editing, Sam? Well, someone had to be the first test to baby, right? And there were bioethicists who said, uh, this is terrible. The the first test tube baby is going to be a disaster. He or she's going to suffer horribly, and that just didn't turn out to be the case. But but um, the the point that I think needs to be made here is that at least according to my reading, look, I'm a philosopher. I'm not a scientist. At least according to my reading, there weren't enough experiments done to give a reasonable assurance that the manipulation on these two embryos would be safe or effective. More work just needed to be done. So so I think that's a point we need to keep in mind. I I think what Sam is saying is supported by the fact that the eventual edits that uh, these girls received weren't the desired ones. I think they were slightly off. Again, I haven't, you know, I, I don't know this for sure, but it's been reported that way. And so that does make it seem like Hub basically didn't have full control uh, 
over the technique uh, that he wanted to practice. And I think that kind of criticism of, you know, guy attempts to do something involving humans and botches it or maybe was overconfident in the likelihood of success. I think every there's nobody who would defend a doctor or a surgeon or her against those criticisms. Um, but I think people criticize him for other things as well, like just having the you know desire to actually, you know, if he if he had a perfectly effective technique and he could have given these girls the genetic variant that protects against uh, HIV, which I think a pretty large percentage of uh, Europeans actually have, at least I think one copy, maybe 10% of Europeans have maybe one allele, one, one of these, you know, even if he had perfect experimental control over what he was trying to do, still many people would have criticized him. Uh, and I think that's, a, that's actually a more interesting discussion to me because nobody's defending him on the reckless charge, recklessness charge. So this is interesting. Early on, people were saying, at least he was reporting, that there weren't any off-target effects. You think there's now evidence? So, okay, this is something we discussed a little bit in our first podcast on this topic. Um, what I'm about to say is my recollection of what He said at the conference on gene editing in Hong Kong, which took place soon after the news broke. And what he said was that they had done, on the embryos, they had done some whole genome sequencing and had seen some hints of off-targets. And the, by off-targets here, I mean edits that were very far from the gene um, that they wanted to edit. So some change in some base pair, which was quite distant. It turns out, as far as I understand, those off-targets were not realized. There was a possibility of those off-targets, and they warned the parents. They actually told the parents, hey, there's some chance of some off-targets of that type. And then the parents decided, it was the parents' decision to go forward with the pregnancy, even though they had other unedited embryos available. So that's something that the press has, I've never seen the press report this. This is something Hugh claimed very explicitly in his presentation, that there were unedited embryos available to the parents that they chose, not he chose, but they chose not to use. Okay, so that, that's a wrinkle to the situation that, this, again— but This also plays into my view this is an issue of reproductive freedom. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And that, on that front, if the parents were fully knowing and, you know, maybe, maybe it's really up to them to decide whether they want to use the unedited or edited embryos. Now— those off-targets that I'm talking about are not the eventual problem that emerged. I think subsequently after the girls were born, they went and carefully, I think, sequenced the actual gene that they wanted to edit. And it turns out the deletion or whatever it was that they were trying to do um, to give the HIV resistance, I think didn't successfully, was not successfully done or was done in some, there was some problem with it. So that specific fact, if true, uh, suggests that her was reckless and and didn't have full control of his technique. And I think everybody would just criticize him for that. Uh, nobody is defending him on those grounds. Or at least had an experimental error that might be, and anybody might have. That's true. And the, but the question is, what's the, I think Sam might say, well, you better characterize the probability of that error well in advance of doing it on real people, right? And I think almost everybody would agree on that point. But if you, in the hypothetical- you probably can't actually characterize unless you actually run experiments with Well, you should do it with monkey. You know, you, you should do like a million monkey. Who knows? I mean, we can argue about exactly what is the safety threshold or what is the, what is the point at which you have a, a, a high confidence level that the thing is working well. But, you know, I think many people would agree that he should have done like at least dozens or hundreds of monkeys or something before he did uh, human uh, babies. So I think I think that's not- so controversial. But imagine that the technique worked really well, okay? And imagine that he went to the parents and said, okay, we've done this. So far, it's just another embryo experiment, one of many that have been done, and said to them, now you have a choice. We have a well-edited set of embryos that you could choose to make into your children, allowed to become your children, or we have this other set that we haven't touched and they seem to be fully viable too. And then the parents say, oh, let's take the edited ones. And by the way, he also explained in his talk in Hong Kong, which again, this was has never been reported uh, as far as I know by any media source. He claimed mm -hmm. that the parents involved in this were highly educated people and that the process took a long time because they had to do the whole IVF extraction process. And so the parents, by the time they made this decision, were very well educated in the relevant genetic technologies. And they were highly educated people. And they chose to implant the edited embryos. Again, that was something that was, as far as I know, not reported. So I think that the actual complexion of the moral issue here it requires full knowledge of all the facts, which I don't even claim to have all the facts here. But it's certainly much more complex than what's discussed uh, publicly.
And by the way, this talk he gave in Hong Kong, it's online. Anybody who, who's interested in this subject, i.e. New York Times reporter, can just go and watch the talk that He gave. And they can, they can say, oh, I don't believe a word He said. Everything he said in this talk is a lie, and therefore I'm discounting it. But as far as I can tell, even that level of analysis has not been done by people who purport to be informing the public on this issue. So one question that um, I would ask, supposing that the technique was perfected, is um, whether parents were informed or the general public maybe was informed that editing the embryos to be less susceptible to HIV might have other effects, like making them more susceptible to uh, influenza or other things. I mean, was that made clear? I think that's that's something to be asked. Yeah, I think we don't know. And I think that's actually not just a hypothetical, Sam, as I recall. I think there is some evidence that they may be more susceptible to an influenza-type disease. I, we have to check on that, but... Well, there, there's a, a, a comment that was published in Nature which suggested that there would be greater, there may well be greater susceptibility to other problems um, against the background of this particular edit. Is that within parents' rights to make that kind of choice? Well, it's, it's a good question, right? I mean, uh, that's something I think we're going to have to decide going forward. So in that scenario where everything works well, and suppose even the science of, you know, what the costs, the positive and negative aspects of having the edit successfully done for that particular girl, suppose that were really well known. Suppose we we characterize the, oh, you have 10% higher lifetime risk of this other condition because of the edit, but you have 90% decrease in risk for HIV because of the edit. Um, Still, that's a trade-off. And then the question is, who should make the decision for that trade-off? Do the parents have the rights to have the right to make that decision? Do they have to get the consent of 80% of their fellow countrymen before they are allowed to make that decision? Or is it just their right to make the decision? I think these are all un unanswered questions. Yeah, I agree with that. There are philosophers, and they're fairly prominent in debate about uh, enhancement, who would say, look, suppose you have two embryos, and it's clear, maybe because of a gene edit that's been done, that one of them is less susceptible to a serious disease than the other. And all of the things are equal between those embryos. Some philosophers say that the parents would actually be acting wrongly, doing something morally impermissible in not implanting the embryo that has a lower chance of, of getting this serious health problem. So there is, uh, among uh, bioethicists, some allegiance to a principle of procreative beneficence, which says something like, of the children you might have, you're morally required to have the ones that are most likely, given present information, uh, to be happy, to have the greatest well-being. Let, let me say that I think that uh, those philosophers are in line with basic folk reasoning that humans have been going through for you know millennia. So imagine that you're, for most of history, humans have been fairly religious, right? So imagine that there are actually gods who can influence what happens in our lives. And imagine that your wife is pregnant. Isn't it evil for you to pray to your god that your daughter will have a higher probability of some sickness rather than to pray to your god that your daughter be born healthy? Most humans would recoil at a father making that prayer. And it's very analogous to this question of choosing between two, two embryos, right? And so I think these philosophers uh, are in line with what humans, the way humans have reasoned about this kind of thing for a long time. I think in the interest of full disclosure also, Steve should mention that he's involved in a startup, actually. Uh, yes, we don't do anything like gene editing, but we do do uh, advanced genetic testing of embryos for IVF clinics. And so this, this is rather close to the kind of thing that we do in which um, we deliver a report to an IVF physician and included in that report could be information as to which of the embryos uh, might 
say, have unusual risk for breast cancer or might have unusual risk for type 1 diabetes. And the predictors are now at the point, um, polygenic predictors, where that kind of risk can be quantified to some degree. And so obviously we think it's reasonable for the parents to have that information and then make a decision based on that information. Well, um, I, I actually think that there's another perspective and it, it's an important one at least to discuss. And that is that what's most important in a human life isn't necessarily well-being. It might be more important, say, just to put it succinctly, to be a good person than to be particularly happy. And um, so, so someone might say, look, um, what would be wrong with flipping a coin, say, between an embryo that seems perfectly fine, given your testing, and one that has a predisposition to asthma? I mean, it might be that the one with a predisposition to asthma will be sensitive to human suffering in a way that the other person wouldn't, and so be better overall. I, I just I think that um, it the first point is that it, it's questionable just to value well-being and not things like being a good person or being a person of good character. And a second point is that I think there is uh, too tight of an association made between even well-being and not having certain disabilities. I mean, who's to say that uh, someone who uh, has asthma is overall less thriving than someone who, who doesn't? This actually comes back to one of your favorite points, Steve which is that highly successful people are often sociopaths. And thus people who actually may have these incredibly, you know, developed talents often have just glaring moral blind spots. Yeah, I mean, if you could make the case that there really were a correlation between, say, the person not having type 1 diabetes, which, you know, manifests when people are still quite young, um, and being a, quote, better person— then obviously one should consider that. But in the absence of that kind of correlation where you, you have a condition which I think everybody agrees is a kind of negative condition to have, um, and little information about any second-order consequences of you know, not having type 1 diabetes, uh, it seems like a, quite a stretch to say that, well, okay, maybe you're just better off in other ways we can't measure uh, even though, you know, I think the life expectancy decrease coming from type 1 diabetes is on the order of a decade or something like that. So um, pretty big effect for you to just suddenly invoke some mysterious things to compensate for. Well, let me ask you a question. Um, wouldn't the, the same reasoning you just used have the following implication? Suppose that there are two people who um, have some dire medical problem. Um, unless they're treated, they're going to expire. But um, if the one gets the treatment, she'll go on living 30 years as a paraplegic. If the other gets the treatment, she'll go on living 30 years in full health, and everything else is equal between them. Isn't it an implication, an implication of the kind of view that you've defended that we should just save straight away the person who, if saved, would not be a paraplegic. So I, I think, you know, that's a, a kind of basic utilitarian calculus and which would come to that conclusion. In this case, you have to remember, we're not telling the parents what decision to make. We're giving them information and then they make the decision. Uh, and secondly, society is not compelling the parents to receive that information. They are seeking that information out actively. Well... Um, they are seeking out that information actively, but are they being told in a measured and careful way what the potential is for life with certain conditions? I mean, I, I'm very worried that um, in cases where uh, selective abortions are performed, sometimes parents are being given, if only through gesture and tone of voice, 
the idea that life with a certain disability would be just awful when through adaptation it turns out that it's really not awful at all and that people who have the disabilities uh, thrive to the same degree as people who don't. So, I mean, to take another example, which is already, I mean, much more widespread than, say, IVF or genetic testing and IVF, it's quite common now through something called NIPT to, um, through DNA fragments in a pregnant uh, woman's blood, to determine the effectively Down syndrome status of the baby that she's carrying. And so I think in the U.S., something like, I think, 90% or more of uh parents who discover such a condition in their uh, the child that's being carried decide to abort it. And so that's a very widespread phenomenon. And so one could criticize this and say, um, maybe these parents don't know what they're doing. Maybe they don't really understand what life with Down syndrome is like. Maybe they should, uh, I don't know, undergo a mandatory six-day intensive course on Down syndrome before they're allowed to make the decision about whether to abort. Um, you know, it, the the issue I think comes down to whether who should make that decision, and then whether the state should intervene in terms of the quote quality of that decision. Um, but but I, I should say that's going on you know around the world, mil, maybe a million times a year. Well, maybe not so, that many times, but quite quite a few times. Well, I think you're exaggerating Sam's point. Sam's not requiring a six day course for anything. He's just questioning whether there's bias in how these potentially these options being presented to parents, and then maybe people are suggesting low qualities of life when the quality of life will not may not be that bad. And it, it, I think parents probably should know, in fact, that currently quality of life for Down syndrome people is much improved over it was decades ago. And you'd think they should ought to know that before they made that decision. Yeah, I think you could argue that, uh, I'm not sure what is exactly is being argued, that we should not allow parents to go through NIPT and make a decision, or that we should try to follow best practices in educating them as to the their decision. I think at the very least that. Yeah. So I, I don't think anybody would dispute that, right? But on the other hand, you know, in most cases, parents who are undergoing this kind of thing, they have to understand what NIPT is. If they get the bad news, you know, which is about 1% of the time, I imagine those parents are going to think very, very hard about this decision. I mean, they've got a baby on hand. It's in, you know, the mother is pregnant. Um, this is probably not made lightly, this decision. So in a way, if you say we should engage in best practices, how could I disagree with that? If you say the state should not allow people to use NIPT technology, then I think you're just nuts. Well, I, I think the, the, the uh, imperative to engage in best practices is somewhat rhetorical. What's at issue is what the best practices are. I mean, um, Shouldn't there be a greater emphasis on educating parents, perhaps from the perspectives of people who have uh, these disabilities, what life is like with them? Um, that, that's number one. Number two, I, I really do worry uh, about your, your use of the term bad news. I worry that parents who discover that one of their embryos um, has a disposition to asthma might think, oh, that's bad news. We've got to, we've got to not implant that embryo. Or the fetus has a predisposition to asthma. That's bad news because we need to have the best child we could have. Um, just the term bad news is a bit worrisome to me. It, it's news. And if you really want to be neutral about a decision, you shouldn't call it bad. Well, I think I used the word bad news in the context of a process where I just said 90% of the parents make a certain decision. So I think they do find it to be bad news. Well, maybe 90% of the people make a decision partly because they uh, take cues from their health practitioners that that's the decision that's expected and respected. Are you, are you specifically saying that in the case of Down syndrome or are you talking about some other hypothetical situation. I would say it in the case of Down syndrome, and I would also say it in the case of other. I would guess that in most cases, uh, it isn't the outside pressure that is causing most American parents to make that decision in the face of you know, news that their child is likely to have Down syndrome. I, I think that most Americans who make that decision actually have a pretty good idea of what 
decision they're making. But again, uh, to say that to say that the process could be improved. About what it's like to have Down syndrome or a kid with Down syndrome. I think I think I think if I had the news, I mean, I I have young kids. You have pretty young kids too. I think if I had the news that my child had Down syndrome, I would have made the decision to abort without thinking about it almost at all. I would have assumed almost right off the bat that this is going to be a bad life that I'd be shackled to the child for for decades. And I don't think, as, I, as, I, as I'm looking back at my decision now, if I was having this conversation, I don't think the decision I would have made a couple of years ago would have been terribly well-informed. I'm speaking personally, right, as an ex-philosopher. Well, I, I, you know, first of all, you didn't, you weren't actually confronted with that decision. And so, you know, the amount of extra study or contemplation or introspection that you might have gone through when confronted with that news um, isn't something that you've gone through, right? So it's very hypothetical what you're saying. Fair point. I, I mean, an abortion is a serious, I mean, I think an abortion is a serious thing. And so generally, I think people, when confronted with that decision where they have a child, which had they gotten different results from the test, they would have been, honestly, I think, relieved and been anticipating the birth of their lovely child. And then so to get that additional news, uh, that different news, and then have to make a very tough decision after that, I think you got to give people some credit that they actually are trying to think and struggle with. Maybe they go and talk to their priest or their rabbi or their mother and make that decision. I think it's 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 a little bit, I think, you know, we're having an academic discussion so we can stake out whatever positions we want. But you're really, in fact, impugning the decisions of millions of people around the world um, you know, who I think are serious and have undergone a serious situation in their lives that, in a way, you're not respecting. Well, I was impugning my hypothetical decision. Yeah, but, but in effect, <laughs> you were impugning other people as well. Okay, guys, I want to I want to switch to a, another topic, um, which I think is a little bit, again, a little bit hypothetical, but also um, not unrealistic. So I think there's some evidence that, in fact, the Chinese government knew what it was doing. And... If that's the case, right, and even if it's if that's the case, there's a possibility that they may have been aware of the enhancement possibilities. Uh, he claims, I think people argued that he wasn't aware of the potential for cognitive enhancement because he didn't get in contact with scientists who had done that research, but the paper was published. Everyone can read it. Um, and so I think one question is, what happens when... Look, it's an incredible advantage to have highly intelligent people in your country. And it's an incredible advantage to have more than a few. So what happens if one country simply decides to start genetically engineering groups of people? I, I think that's a great question. Uh, what, what may happen is a genetic engineering race. I mean... Um, it's great to have a couple of people who are, are really, really smart. That's wonderful. Suppose you could have thousands through enhancement. There would be network effects. These really, really smart people would talk to each other. They'd come up with new economic ideas. They'd come up with uh, advancements in technology, presumably. And that would make the government, depending on where you are and how much government is involved stronger and maybe more powerful so um, I think it's naive to think that uh, enhancement will just be something that individual parents are interested in to say get their kids in the best college or make sure they earn enough money or get prestige I think governments are going to be interested in this and that a justification for their interest might ultimately be self-defense. Yeah, I think that's completely reasonable. Um, I think there's already um, a case where, for example, in Singapore, they encourage, they, they realize demographically that highly educated people uh, were having fewer kids than less educated people. Uh, true in many countries, but they they sort of noticed and did some noticed it and tried to do something about it in Singapore, where they actually devoted some government budget to try to create dating programs or encouragements or inducements for highly educated people to have more kids. Um, so they're clearly directionally heading in that direction, whether they would 
uh, eventually engage in genetic engineering or embryo selection in that direction, I don't know, but um, it wouldn't be uh, inconsistent with what they've done before. I think it didn't work. I, I think, well, it depends on what you mean by work. Did it slightly increase the rate of reproduction of highly educated people? Probably. But did it actually uh, tilt the balance back in that direction? I don't think it did. And I guess this also raises the fundamental question of, suppose that one government does this, then what happens to other governments? You, I think you effectively have the same example of kind of the principle of beneficence on an individual level be going to a national level. Because just as it's important for, you know, if, you're, if your kid's going to get genetically engineered, then in some sense, tell up my kid, I've got to do that too. And if, if China's doing this, then it seems like the U.S. is going to be forced to go down that line too. Yeah, I think we could very well have a kind of runaway competition, kind of like with nuclear weapons, where no country can afford not to be uh, involved in this. Um, so that is a real possibility for the future, I think. So... Lastly, I want to come back to the um, the college admission scandal. And are we wait? Are we leaving embryos completely? Should no, we, no, no. We're, this is the connect. Okay. This is a connection. Oh, okay, okay. This connection. So <laughs> we found some parents basically engaging in a lot of shenanigans to get their kids into college. Lots of dishonest stuff. Because be blunt, their kids couldn't have gotten in otherwise. And I guess the question this raises is: down the line, is all this going to become just irrelevant because these wealthy parents? They have the means to do this through genetic engineering. Yeah, you know, the, for example, the embryo selection uh, cost, um, the cost of IVF plus some additional genetic testing, um, it's a tiny, tiny fraction of what these people were spending to cheat to get their kids into USC. So, uh, yes, once the technology is sort of proved safe and effective, um, people with sort of long planning horizons who can sort of think 10, 20 years ahead would probably be better off doing this uh, than bribing a sailing coach or water polo coach at USC. Yeah, I think that, that that's right. Um, I really worry about our capacity to edit, supposing it becomes possible, in uh, an in intelligent way. I, I'm concerned that um, upper middle class and rich parents will edit their embryos in a way that is really predictable. Like what would they do? Have kids who are tall, um, who have certain musical ability or quantitative ability, uh, maybe blue eyes. I, I don't know. Um, I wonder what would happen in a, in a free market of editing. Um, would we would we lose something? Would um, there be even more privileging of a kind of uh, narrow set of qualities than we already have? I'm not sure. My prediction is that what will happen in the case of editing and selection is perhaps what you already find in the market for. Uh, sperm and for eggs, which is you find a preference for precisely those characteristics. And on dating websites. And on dating websites for precisely those characteristics, just kind of put on steroids. Um, I, I think it's easy to paint the dystopian picture, and I'm not saying that dystopian picture won't emerge because people are really pretty, maybe short sighted and and shallow in many ways. So the same families that were trying to get their kids into USC, you can't imagine what kind of edits they would be ordering up from their uh, physician. So, or rather, we, or rather, you can imagine. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so are we looking? At, so we had this discussion uh, last time we talked to uh, uh, David uh, Scribina. Scribina, yeah, I keep mispronouncing his name. Sorry, David. Um, about a kind of. Um, Runaway technology, right? We, we're the people who created this technology, and presumably we have free will, and so to some extent could control it. But, you know, I personally have serious doubts about our abilities to do this once something becomes possible. Yeah, for Sam's benefit, this guy David Scribina is a philosopher of technology, and he was a correspondent with the Unabomber for over a decade. 
and they've actually co-published a book together. And so this guy embraces a philosophy in which he believes that technology is not really very controllable by people. It's become its own kind of system interacting with humans that uh, could easily run away in directions which are um, maybe could cause exponent, uh, ex- existential risk to us or just be a very unhealthy for the thriving of people. And so um, in this discussion, I think uh, he would be very strongly against the idea that any of these genetic technologies should be permitted. But I should also say he's against, you know, nuclear energy and combustion engines and Cell phones. Um, AI as well. So he, he's definitely a sort of anti-technology. But we already have gigantic technological development, which has produced the climate change. Right, so um, we can't go back in time and change that. Oh, he w- he wants to do precisely that. He's he's arguing for a pretty radical point of view. Yeah, like I mean, so Kaczynski was willing to blow people up to you know uh, roll attempt to roll back the clock technologically, and Scribina argues that we should, after thoughtful consideration, decide to roll ourselves back to an earlier stage of technological development. But what if we can't get ourselves back without, say, for example, engaging in gene editing in order to get us through a period where there are these much higher temperatures and a lot more diseases out there? Yeah, I, I, I can't say, well, speaking for myself, I wasn't uh, didn't come away as a supporter of his thesis. Maybe Corey did. Um, but uh, <laughs> 12th century has its virtues. Yeah. But uh, um, yeah, some of those are some issues that I think are unresolved in his philosophy. But Sam, right. you do bring up the fact that you know there there are arguments for gene editing uh, along the lines that it's going to make us better able to survive in environments we may be facing, such as extremely high temperatures, and so that you know desire to have your kid be able to not pass out. <laughs> I I don't know if you guys have ever read any of this, but so Freeman Dyson, the physicist, has written books actually going back 30, 40 years in which he says probably the way humans are going to actually colonize space is by genetically engineering ourselves to be much more tolerant of zero gravity and high radiation and things like this. So he's already advocated for this kind of thing for a long time. Um, And so that's more not the dystopian, but utopian view on this kind of technology. Do either of you think that there's any way to put this back in the bag? I mean, this is going to happen, isn't it? Well, as, a, just... as a guy who's actually involved in it, yes, I would say there's there's no turning. I mean, short of the kind of thing the Unabomber wanted, um, I don't think you can turn back the clock. And I think there's even a coordination problem if, say, 10 of the leading nations in the world wanted to turn back the clock. They would have a hard time enforcing it on everybody else. Um, so, yes, I, I, I think... It's it's as David Scribino would say, technology out of control in a sense. So, so I know we, um, you guys pushed back on this early on in our discussion, but I want to come back to the next decade or two, where I think we're going to have to be working out this technology, whether we like it or not. So what are your thoughts? Both of you criticize her for what he did, saying it was kind of reckless and, um, you know, uh, premature, but presumably if we're going to get to the future that we think has happened, whether we like it or not, uh, people are going to go through stages of doing experiments, and not just on monkeys and not just on mice. There's going to be new genetically engineered kids, and at some point, you, know, you can keep saying it's all going to be unethical until it's finally working, but how are you going to navigate the next two decades? Or well, so many decades. I think Sam raised a good example with the early test tube babies. So people were extremely negative and uh, about that. I think possibly irrationally so. But but you know if if your thought was that the test tube babies were going to not be healthy and suffer a lot, um, uh, then that to me that's a pretty reasonable uh, reason to be against it. But uh, and and so there was a quite a risk for the first few, right? Uh, you didn't know how it was going to turn out. But then once it turned out to be okay, then I think it turns out to be quite a beneficial technology for us. And I think a million test tube babies are born every year now worldwide. Um, we'll probably have a similar period of time with gene editing where for the first few, I don't know if the number is hundreds or thousands of 
babies that are born through that kind of procedure, we won't quite know exactly whether it's going to turn out well or badly for them. And you may be right, Corey, that there's no avoiding that period of experimentation in order to get to the other side. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So are we to say that in this kind of gray period, it's just we're in kind of ethical netherland where the stuff's not morally acceptable, it's going to happen anyway, and then as a result of this, these immoral but inevitable experiments, we're eventually going to get to a point where the technology is now solid enough, and then what's done is ethical. No, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Steve. Oh, I was just going to say that maybe the three of us could try to think of what the most positive scenario would be that would justify experimentation while the technology is still potentially a little bit shaky, but where the benefit is such that you know maybe the parents have some mutation that they really need to have fixed. Um, in their child, that you can sort of justify that as a as a place where you would allow some experimentation to go forward. In the case of test tube babies, it was these parents have an infertility a fertility problem; they would not be allowed to have kids. Somehow, we're allowing them to take a risk with the kid um, in order so that they can become parents. Um, I don't know what the best case scenario is for in the current stage for gene editing. Um, Part of the criticism is often that if, if it is a mutation that needs to be corrected, the parents could instead go through IVF and screen against that mutation. That's much safer and much more proven technology. So what's the case for gene editing uh, for reproductive purposes? And maybe the three of us can think of uh, a good example to push it forward. I actually don't know off the top of my head because I actually think those arguments that embryo selection is a better alternative right now than gene editing uh, seems pretty strong. Well, one possibility, I think, is to have a lot of sympathy for parents who both want to be genetically related to their offspring and are both affected by a mutation such that any offspring they would have would have some serious health deficit. In that sort of case, and you're the scientist, you, you can tell me what precisely we would call them. And that sort of case, in order to um, really help the parents have offspring that's genetically related to both of them, wouldn't it be true that gene editing would be the only way to go? Right. So I think, Sam, that's a good example. So if, if both parents are carriers of, say, two copies of a recessive disease gene, but somehow have survived, so it's not fully lethal or wasn't lethal in their case, and they want to have a genetic sort of true genetic child, then your only option is probably to edit. Um, and so that, that would probably be the best argument. Um, and we could probably come up with a disease with really negative consequences for having two copies, but doesn't preclude people reaching reproductive age. I wonder if there are c- cases of blindness that are like this, actually, maybe deafness. Although you know there's uh, quite no, a No, that, that would, yeah, you'd get a lot of pushback for that. Of, yeah, I'm thinking of something with really negative health impact, maybe lowers your life expectancy to 35 or something, or who knows, but uh, they want to have a healthy kid. So, so that'll ar- probably be it. So arguably in those cases, it it's plausibly ethical to engage in gene editing. Right. It, of course, there it's the desire of these parents to not adopt a kid, not use an egg donor. Um, but really to have a genetically, re- you know, full uh, child, fully genetically related child. And so do you judge that desire as important enough that you're willing to take the, whatever risks are necessary to try to edit the, the embryo? I can see people saying, no, <laughs> that, that desire, I can understand the desire, but it's not that important. I can see people saying that. It also doesn't satisfy Corey's desire because those are such special cases, right? This is a very special case of a very specific set of mutations that it maybe doesn't allow you to fully test and perfect the technology because there will be vast parts of the genome um, that in the future for the crazy sci-fi applications, you would want to have some experience editing that might not uh, play a role in these uh, scenarios. So you, I think you want a full-blown program where, you know, to beat the Russians or the Chinese, we have to start experimenting and we're going to break some eggs. Well, that's you, Steve, not me, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but no, look, the genes have, have multiple effects, right? And so it's going to be very, very hard in many of the genes that you, people might want to edit to actually know what effect they're going to have. I mean, you can see an effect in a mouse and maybe in a monkey, but the effects often become full-blown in 
in the case of people, and you're not going to know that until you edit. So I, I, my personal view is that whether you like this technology or not, you're going to go through a period of real kind of moral unclarity where it's kind of the Wild West. And paradoxically, uh, this period is going to get you to a point where the science is better understood, and then what was unethical is going to become ethical. That's just my kind of prediction, but... But um, so in this scenario where you, you sort of want widespread or, you, or you, somehow widespread experimentation is realized, um, can it happen in a non-totalitarian state? Because most parents who don't have this very special problem that we were discussing earlier, where both parents are carry, have two copies of something, um, are most parents going to want to do crazy experimentation on their kid? I mean... Unless the government orders it to happen somehow, or compels people to do it, maybe it won't be widespread. You know, my guess is that, and again, it's very hard to figure out what you do in their situation. I, I, I'm not attracted to doing this, let me say. But, but you think there'll be enough people? I think there'll be enough people. The, the problem is I think it'll often go on in kind of corners that aren't very well monitored. So there'll be these experiments that are, in fact, not controlled. But over time, and, and who knows, you know, there's a billion people on this planet, and you can get a fairly good sample size by a very small percentage of them trying this out. But people are going to try this, and the data will emerge in kind of a haphazard fashion. It's, it's fairly low barrier to entry stuff. So if you have an IVF clinic, then to be able to edit the embryo, it's not very much additional capex uh, to do that. And they already have generally some kind of sequencing and genotyping capabilities at bigger clinics so to check the results and things like that. So, for example, I think the amount of money that her had to spend was not large. I mean, we edit animal embryos all the time on this campus. Right. And presumably, you could just do exactly the same Correct. techniques for people. Yep. You're not reassuring me. <laughs> I wanted to kind of, you know, go ahead, Sam. No, go ahead. Um, yeah, look, I don't know how we got into this slightly dystopian corner. I, I find this stuff incredibly unnerving because I, I, I find it hard to get away from the dystopian future. I, I, Wait, why, why dystopian? I mean, I mean, it could end up that people are living 200 years and have high IQs and, you know. I, I see enormous inequality emerging, far greater than it emerges now. I see the powerful taking advantage of the weak uh, as a result of this. Um, and presumably you could argue that, look, maybe even people across the world, poor people, could all have access to this. Yeah. Let, let me make the following claim, that we will, and this is not a normative claim, this is, a, I guess, a prediction. So we will live through a period, either because of embryo selection or gene editing, I think selection is actually easier, um, where there is some increased inequality, because some affluent people are able to do it and do it in a pretty aggressive way and get you know, good results. But then you ask, uh, if you have a progressive country like uh, a Norway or United Kingdom, which has a national healthcare system, and remember, these technologies are, technologies are cheap, and we kind of agreed that they can be actually economically beneficial to the society as a whole, what would stop those countries from suddenly making it free, part of your healthcare system? And then the inequality gap would narrow quite, quite the a The intra-country inequality gap narrows the... The gap between different countries, right. so inter-country will, gap, is going to widen. Correct. That's my worry. There You're will gonna, be countries that don't get their act together and are not able to implement these programs, right? And so, yes, then that inequality will widen. Well, there are countries that have only a few hundred dollars to spend per year on citizens for health care. I mean, it's not a question of getting their act together. It's a question of, you know, having an act to get. I mean, I just... Uh, I, I really share Corey's worry uh, about inequalities between countries. Like we currently have. <laughs> but, but, I mean, if you look at GDP inequality. But, but, but that, imagine that increasing by a factor of 10. You know, it's interesting. I was reading some of the uh, philosophical literature uh, on this, and some philosophers are expressing the principle effectively that you have to look at the effects of gene editing on inequality, and you shouldn't do it if it's going to increase inequality. And I think that's a great principle, but it just belies human nature. It's like saying you can't have a graduate program in computer science because it might increase uh, inequality. It probably does. But isn't there a distinction here where 
these enhancements would be passed down to future generations. I mean, this is not just an advantage for who's living now, but who's going to live. Isn't that an important distinction? It, I would say, yes, it is an important distinction. It, it somehow, it's sometimes overplayed um, on the negative side where people say, oh, suppose you make a mistake. Your, your, your uh, descendants are all stuck with that mistake. And of course, in this future that we're envisioning, they're not because obviously they can edit back, right? If, it, if, it's a, if it turns out not to be a good edit to have made, they could pay and have it gotten rid of for their kids. So that, that part of it, I think, is overblown a little bit. But to give a persistent advantage to some group of people, yes, that is a real issue that you should think about. Actually, the Nuffield Council um, on Bioethics, that's a UK outfit, put out some principles on the ethical use of uh, germline editing. There are necessary conditions for its being morally okay. And one of them says that the use of embryos um, that have been genetically edited should be permitted only when it cannot be reasonably expected to produce or exacerbate social division or the unmitigated marginalization or disadvantage of groups within society. So, What planet are these people living on? I mean, that's the, that's the whole point people can edit their kids. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's what they came up with. Um, you know, I, w under what circumstances can't it reasonably be expected that uh, gene editing for enhancement would um, in no way increase inequality? I mean, it, maybe their purpose is just to say, look, uh, we're just a, in effect against uh, using these technologies for enhancement. Yeah, I, I, I can't say I understand what their thinking is here. Or that they're thinking about people who are different from us. As maybe far as maybe our... they are just thinking about curing a disease, and then that doesn't, uh, like a, a, pre, a, present, a condition that was already present in the parents, and so that doesn't increase inequality. Right, exactly. And maybe they're, they're implying that um, uh, enhancement is just a no-go morally, right. period. But let me let me throw this out for the two of you. Like, uh, imagine that we, I mean, this issue of international um, inequality that's tough to solve. But imagine that we had our beneficial world government, uh, Star Trek in the twenty third century, and the government has been studying gene editing for quite a while and decided that, yeah, actually we can do some positive things for people. If you remember, Vulcans live several times longer than humans. And gee, wouldn't it be nice if humans could live as long as Vulcans and be as smart as Vulcans? Um, we've figured out a way to do that, and we're going to roll it out to everyone. Anyone who wants it can take it. If you don't want to take it, you don't have to take it. Do you guys have a problem with that? Well, um, there could still be a lot of social inequality depending on what other material factors were involved. I just want to be clear that um, giving this technology to everyone wouldn't in itself solve inequality problems. I mean, if a certain percentage of the population owned 90% of the resources, making everyone live longer wouldn't change that. Um, but other things being equal, I love Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> well, didn't you think it was unfair that uh, Spock, you know, the Vulcans are so much better than humans, right? They, they live several hundred years. They seem to be smarter. They have super strength also. They didn't have any fun. They had their own fun once every seven years or something. <laughs> they seem to be okay. But, but anyway, I, I, I think I, I was always amazed in Star Trek. So there was this, this famous episode called Space Seed with Ricardo Montalban playing Khan. And he was a genetically uh, engineered human from, you know, 200 years ago. And the first thing he says is, you know, I can't believe you guys have not improved yourselves after all this time. You have these warp engines and stuff like this, and you haven't improved yourself selves. And he doesn't say it in the episode, but in some of the novels, uh, he'll, he would say something like, how can you guys coexist with these Vulcans? They're so much better than you. And why didn't you guys improve yourselves? Well... Uh, I think Khan himself, to betray a somewhat deep knowledge of Star Trek, <laughs> is an exemplar 
for why they didn't improve themselves because he is a psychopath. <laughs> He's smarter, he lives longer, but he has no moral core. Right, but then you have Spock, who has a very strong moral core and has all those superior capabilities as well. Right, but were Vulcans enhanced or did they evolve the way they are? My understanding, and I could be incorrect here, I defer to you, is that they evolved that way. I, I'm not so some of it is evolution because they come from a planet that's hotter and has higher gravity than Earth. But uh, there is some, I think, controversy in the canon as to whether the Vulcans themselves went through some genetic engineering. Uh, they're they're a much older civilization than ours, so uh, it's not clear at all what they did to get to the point that they're at. Corey, he mentioned the canon. I'm intimidated. I can't say any more <laughs> about Star Trek. Anyone who brings up the canon, that's way over my head. <laughs> Well, look, guys, I think this is a great place to uh, to just end our conversation for today. Um, but I, Sam, I hope you'll be back. This was a fabulous amount of fun. And uh, I honestly think these are conversations we need to keep having. Thank you very much. 